I have two daughters, and uh, my youngest daughter has always had this, uh, I don't know if you'd say fear or worry, uh, of missing out. You know, she'd always hear something in another room and will have to go see what's going on there. I might be missing out. She'd always have a terrible time deciding to, to go somewhere do something because if she went there, she'd miss out on what was here or somewhere else. And even now, she's always asking when she hears us talking, what was that you said? What was that? She just, you know, she's not content with this idea that maybe I'm missing something. And in one sense, that's not all bad. You know, I remember a uh, cartoon from years ago and it showed some cows and, and the caption was, cows are content. You know, there's a side of contentment that's good and a side of contentment that's bad. You know, when it comes to what God has given us and when he's given it to us or what he's allowed in our life, we should be content with that. We should trust him. But when it comes to what God intends for us in this life, you know, the spiritual growth that he intends and expects, we shouldn't be content with where we are. In that sense, it's not necessarily a good thing, and we should be wondering, am I missing out? Now, I don't know if I were to ask people, I don't know that anyone would say, yes, I'm content with less than God wants for me. But the problem is, and, and this reminds me of another thing from my youngest daughter, as she's the youngest because she has an older sister, three years older, and if you've ever experienced that dynamic, either personally or with your kids, you know the older one's always making a point of how much more she knows. Well, my youngest daughter came up with a reply for that. She would always say, you don't know what you don't know. And I loved that idea. But I think that that encapsulates so much of us. You know, there are things, it's not that we would say, yes, I'm content with less than God intends for me, but we might not know what we don't know. We might not know that we're missing out. And so that's the central question that's going to guide us today. You'll see it on the handout there. Am I missing some of what God intends for me? Am I missing some of what he intends. And that word intends has a, a couple of meanings. First of all, there is an idea of what God expects from me. God does have expectations for us as Christians, things he wants us to do and not do. But also, it has a, a fuller meaning of what God offers to me as a Christian. You know, we need to realize that where God's focus is and where ours should be. You know, God created us to have this loving relationship with him where we worship and glorify him and he provides for and blesses us. God wants to bless us. You know, think about it. God's main purpose is not to have creatures who don't sin. If that was the case, he wouldn't have created us. <laughs> then there would be no creatures who sin, right? God knew there would be sin. He knew we would still have it, but he still created because he wants to bless us. And so to, to want that, to want all that God intends for me is not being selfish. It is seeking to bring glory to God for how great he is. And so we shouldn't be satisfied with anything less than God intends for us. Now, to answer this question as we look at it today, we're going to begin to look at the book of Colossians. And uh, I give this warning, and it's been true as, as I've gone through the past three times I've uh, dug into a book. Ever since I, I really learned some lessons about how to dig a little deeper, I've gone through Matthew and James and Ephesians, and every time I haven't liked what I've found out on one level. It's like an onion, you know, you, you get deeper and deeper. I've been used to the surface level, and that's okay, but you start to get deeper, and wow, that can be uncomfortable can be challenging. But uh, along with warning you that you may not like what you hear, I will promise you that you can grow from what we see. It has been my experience with myself personally, my family, those who have gone through the, the books with me. There's always things there that I don't care how long you've been a Christian, you look at them and see, wow, God's got something new and exciting and an opportunity for me. And I want that in my life, and God wants it for us. 
Now, before we look at the verses in Colossians, just to give a little background, Colossians was written by Paul. You know this man who started off initially as a persecutor of Christians, and he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he became the, the chief proponent of Christianity, certainly the author of the New Testament, and as a missionary, he traveled around. Well, Paul wrote this letter from prison, we, we can tell, as he says, that he's in prison, he's in chains. It doesn't say exactly when, and he had a couple of times. Uh, we think it was while he was in Rome, which would mean the letter was written around the year 62. So uh, a little over 30 years after Jesus died, Paul is writing this letter to the church in Colossae. And another thing we don't know is exactly when that church was started. A lot of times in the book of Acts, it will tell us about his missionary journeys, and Paul started a church here and here and here. Colossae is not mentioned. And so we don't know exactly. What we can tell is it wasn't started by Paul personally. He says he hasn't been there. So it seems that someone that Paul brought to Christ then went and started this church in Colossae. What we do know is a key reason for writing this letter was Paul had received news that said there were false teachers that were starting to, to come to the city or were in the city, were starting to spread their false teaching among the Christians there. And once again, we don't know exactly what they were saying, but we can tell from what Paul says about them, the things that he says to emphasize the truth. And so what we can tell is there's an element of what is, were known as the Judaizers. And these were Jews who had become Christians, but hadn't left law-keeping behind. Now, as Christians, certainly we have principles, and you call that law. We have things God wants us to do and not do. But these Judaizers said you need to do or not do those just to be saved, just to maintain your relationship with God. It's all based on that. And they brought in the Old Testament law, and Paul is frequently arguing against that false teaching. Seems like there's also an element of what was known as Gnosticism. And that word simply means knowledge, and it was people who basically said, we've got secret knowledge, and if you want to either become a Christian or definitely reach the highest level of Christianity, you need the secret knowledge that we have that not everyone else has. Well, one thing we do know, that all false teaching, what Paul's talking about, and really all false teaching, all false religions, one thing they have in common is that they're all focused on works, versus grace. Earning my relationship with God, either initially or continuing it. It's all based on how well I do or don't do. It's all up to me, which means false teaching also is all focused on me versus God. And in the case of Christianity, me and what I do versus Christ and what he did. And so you will see throughout this book, Paul is making the point that is wrong and our focus has to be on the glorious Christ. And that comes up very soon in chapter 1, and then he refers to it throughout the rest of the book. Now, maybe you know that Colossians is very similar to Ephesians. There are things that are almost word for word and definitely thought for thought of what he says there. From what we can tell, it seems like he wrote the book of Colossians and specifically had these false teachers in mind. And then it seems like he said, you know, there were a lot of good things in there. I think the people in Ephesus would like to hear them, but they didn't have the false teachers, so you don't see as much of that element. And he expands upon some of the things. So you'll see a lot of things that are similar. Let's look then. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8 today. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. And what I'll do is the main passage, uh, keep your Bibles open to that, and then any other verses will be on that handout there. So let's start. Verse 1, it says, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love with which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. All right, let's look at these verses. Let's dig down into them. See what Paul, through, under the inspiration of God and the Holy Spirit, is writing. 
It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, an apostle is simply a messenger, but in biblical terms, the apostles were a select group of people. It talks about the fact that the apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church, these people who receive revelation from God. Jesus is the cornerstone. They're the foundation. And he points out, by the will of God, and again, you, you have to read these things in light of what you see after you've read the whole book. And that's why it's good that you read through a book and get the big picture, and then you read back through and see other things in light of that. Well, Paul is stressing the fact, I'm an apostle, I'm one of the select group. I'm telling you these things by the will of God. And the implication is he's setting this up, these false teachers aren't. What they're saying doesn't come from God. They're not one of this group. He says, to the saints... And the faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. In the saints, the people who are set apart by the message, by the gospel of God, the people who are faithful to that message. Again, those elements of versus anyone who follows the false teaching. You know, to the brethren, your translation might say brothers, and it certainly includes women as well. Brothers and sisters, members, Christians, part of this church. And it's referring to this close relationship we have as Christians. We're part of one family. We're part of one body. And again, in light of what he's going to be talking about, you're, he's saying you're going to need that encouragement that comes from fellow brothers and sisters to face any obstacle and trial that you face, but certainly to face this false teaching. And so he's setting up everything. Well, then he really gets into it in verse 3. He says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, in the Greek, and you'll see even in the New American Standard, verses 3 through 8 is all one sentence. Apparently, Paul was never taught about run-on sentences, and so it goes all the way through there, one sentence. And sometimes it's a little hard to, to get, okay, what are you referring to in this sentence? But let's check it out and see. He says, we give thanks to God. Now, as you go through the book, and this is important whenever you're studying a passage or a book, you look for ideas, words, ideas that repeat. And in Colossians, this idea of thankfulness and gratitude is found six times. Paul is telling them every other time after this, you need to be thankful, you need to have gratitude. Well, here he is, and he's showing, I do the same thing. I give thanks. We, me and the people who are, are with me, who are ministering, we give thanks to God. It's something we do. And notice he says, we give thanks to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, think about those false teachers. The Lord Jesus Christ, the master of all. Christ, you remember that title, the Greek title, is the same as the Hebrew title, Messiah. The, the special anointed one that the Jews have been waiting for for thousands of years, he's the one, and his father is God. Who are you going to listen to, him or these other people? He's setting it up that way. Praying always for you, and you see this in Paul's letters, both in what he does for others and he asks for himself. You see how important it is as Christians to pray for one another, and certainly for physical things, but more often than not, Paul is asking for spiritual things. We pray for you, and he's going to talk about what he prays for, what he's thankful for, and what he prays, and it's focused on their spiritual growth. And you know what I also see when I read this? Praying always for you. How often have you, has someone asked you, or maybe you've said, I'll pray for you, and we sort of forget, don't we? I don't think Paul forgot. I think when he says, I pray always for you, he prayed always for them. It was a regular thing, and I tell you, we need to take that seriously. If we're going to pray for someone, do whatever it takes to remind yourself. You know what? Have something that triggers the memory. Set it down, a paper, a note, whatever, and pray for each other. And he says there, we pray always for you since we heard, verse 4, of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love with which you have for all the saints. Now we're going to see this is really the when versus the why of his things. Ever since we heard of these things, we've been praying for you. What did he hear of? Well, he heard of two things. First of all, their faith in Christ Jesus. And there's a lot of stuff today that's going to really provide the foundation for what we're going to see later. And so we're going to, you know, every once in a while I'm going to stop like this, this idea of in Christ. If you're familiar with Paul, this is a very common theme in Paul, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in him. And it's talking about Christians. And, and what it is, it's getting across this 
I call it the sphere of, of Christianity. We were outside of it, and now we're inside of it, and it's different. It's almost as if we used to live on land, and now we've been changed so that we live underwater. It's a whole different environment, sphere, everything. We're in it now. And it talks about this all-encompassing nature of the Christian life. I'm in him, everything I do. I don't come in him on Sunday morning, and then I step out of him for Monday through Saturday. I'm in him. I'm in him like my arm is in my body. It's attached. It's a part of me. That's us. Paul says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. So he's talking about this faith that characterizes people who are in Christ Jesus. He says in another place, walk by faith, not by sight. And I love it because he's not making a statement. It's just like a side reference of Christians. You know, we walk by faith, not by sight. He doesn't prove it. Like, of course, that's just a given. Well, so he's saying here, you all are living that life that Christians should live, a life by faith in God. And he also has heard of the love with which you have for all the saints. Remember when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What he said, he said, love the Lord your God all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. And he said, I'm going to throw in another one for free. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on this hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, these encompass everything. Any command you'll find will fall under either love the Lord or love others or, or both. You know, anytime, you know, when it says don't gossip, don't steal, don't lie, well, I won't do that to someone if I love them. And so this is all encompassing for obedience, and it made me think of the old hymn. You know, he talks about faith and, and this love that encompasses obedience. The old hymn, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Those do encompass our, our Christian life. Now, one thing to realize is they're not equal in the sense of trust and obey, these two equal things. Our obedience comes out of our trust. Our obedience comes out of our faith. Why do I obey what God says when it looks difficult? Because I trust he knows best. As we saw last week, I trust he's in control and he loves me. So even though there's a part of me that would like to disobey what he says, I'm going to trust he knows what he's talking about. It won't always work out the way I want it to, but it'll work out in God's ultimate glory, to his glory, and it'll work out for the best. Trust and obey. And Paul says, that's what I see and you Christians. Ever since I've seen that, we give thanks. Verse 3, again, just to set up as we're going through, because remember, it's one sentence. We just have to stop once in a while. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love with which you have for the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now, here's one of those places where it's unclear what Paul is, is saying. Is he saying that my prayer is because of the hope that's laid up for you, or is he saying that the, this faith in Christ and the love for others comes because of the hope that you have? And if you have the NIV, and here's the thing, in the Greek it's unclear, and the New American Standard leaves it that way, the English Standard Version leaves it that way. The NIV takes a position and says, the faith and hope that spring from the hope stored up in you. In other words, you have hope, and out of that springs faith and love. I don't agree with that. I think it's the other idea. I think Paul is saying, I'm praying for you ever since I heard of your faith and love, but I'm praying because of your hope. And here's why I say that. Because faith doesn't spring from hope. Hope springs from faith. Let me explain what I mean here. You know, as you talk about the difference, and I used to struggle, what's the difference between faith and hope? They sound sort of similar, you know, faith for this, hope for that. Well, the difference is faith is this idea of trusting, again, not just believing, but truly acting on it, resting on it, risking on it at times. It's trust that we have on, in God based on past actions, things that we have read about in the Bible and we've come to believe the Bible is credible, it's accurate, it's truthful, we've seen what God has done, chief of which is the resurrection, like he's all-powerful, he's all-loving, I can trust him based on past actions that he's done in our lives. I've seen you work, God. I know how amazing you are, how totally in control and how much you always love me, and so I trust you. And it's, you know, my favorite example of faith. And uh, I, I love to use this. It comes from the third Indiana Jones movie. If you've ever seen that one. And it has to do, he's looking for the Holy Grail in that movie. Wouldn't that be something? The, the cup that Christ used at the Lord's Supper. 
And his father's been looking for it too, and his father has this journal. And they finally got into the place where it rests, which, by the way, when they shot it, it's actually in uh, Jordan. And I, I've been there, El Kazan. I rode up there, and you see the big facade that they you know, show, us, show going into. There's nothing really in it like they have, but it is what they ride up to. And so he's there, and they found the place, and his father has, here's the three tests you have to pass to get to the place where the cup is. And, you know, he sees the first one, and it says, the breath of God, only the penitent man will pass. And he's, well, what is that? What is that? And just at the last second, the penitent man is humble, and so he kneels, and blades come right, you know, would have cut his head off. And so then the second one is, the word of God, only in the footstep of God's will you proceed. And there's this place with stones and all the letters that he has to step on the ones that spell out Jesus' name. And then the last one is the one that shows the faith. It's the path of God, only a leap from the lion's head. Will he be able to to cross that? And if you've seen that, here he is, and it looks like there's this huge chasm, you know, from here all the way further than anyone could jump and down so deep you're going to die if you fall. And you remember, he takes that step. And it turns out there's a bridge there that blends in with the rocks around it so you can't see it. That is faith. It's not just believing something, it's acting on it, but even more, it's based. Here's the thing, don't ever let anyone tell you faith is the opposite of reason. Faith is the opposite of sight. I can't see it, but there is good reason for it. He had good reason. That journal had proven to be true twice before. He kneeled and it saved his life. He stepped on the right things and it kept him alive. I can trust this journal, and so he did. That's what we have. I've seen God's work in the Bible. I've seen God's work in my life. And so I trust him now. Well, out of that trust, that faith then, comes hope. The difference between faith and hope is faith is in God in general, based on what he's done. Hope is in something God has specifically promised. I have hope of salvation. I have hope of heaven. Why God promised those to me But it comes, again, from my faith. I've seen God work. You don't just, the very first thing someone tells you, hey, if you become a Christian, you go to heaven. You're like, okay. You want some evidence that says, okay, how can I believe that? Know there is a God. Know that I need salvation. Know that he provides it. Well, that's what, again, you see, and I develop this faith. And it's the basis of hope. And so I believe that's what Paul's saying. I give thanks to God for you. Ever since I heard of your faith and your love, but I give it because of this hope that you have. And again, hope is one of those words. I feel like, you know, I need a dictionary (laughs) nowadays. But hope has been so corrupted by people because when people today say, I hope for something, it's the very opposite of biblical hope. Biblical hope is a confident expectation. I don't see it. I don't have it yet. But I have confidence it's going to come about. I have confidence as a Christian I'm going to heaven. Well, hope today is, is not just a lack of confidence, it's the very opposite, because what do you hear people saying? You know, I hope I win the lottery. Well, the odds are 300 million to one against that. <laughs> That's the very opposite of hope. You know, it used to be, I hope the Cubs win the World Series. Finally, that one worked out. But that's it. Worldly hope is the very opposite. But even biblical hope, there's the idea of my hope, but there's the object of my hope, my, the hope that I have. And that's what Paul's talking about. I am thankful for the hope you have. I am thankful you as Christians have eternity waiting for you. I'm so thankful that you heard the truth and you accepted it and you are going to be spending eternity in heaven. I'm so thankful for that. For God and the glory it brings him and for you and what it means to you. I'm so thankful for that hope. And then he says, that treasure laid up for you in heaven. And the point there is, this hope that we have, it's safe in heaven. No one can get to it there. Have you ever had anything stolen from you? Ever been robbed? You know, my wife and I, we sold a house. And, you know, so we would have realtors come to show the house. And we would go out while they showed the house. Well, one time we came back, and, and I forget the first thing we noticed, but, you know, my wife was like, where's the DVD player? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Where's my computer? <laughs> Where, where's this knife? Where's this thing? And it turns out the realtor, whether he was real or not, whatever, he came by. The dogs were all nice and locked up, so they wouldn't bother him. Took all these things. And, you know, the worst part of it, I had an old receiver that was outdated. He didn't take that. Because I got the other things replaced with something newer, the DVD player, the computer. But I'm like, why didn't you take my receiver? Come on, can you come back? Uh, we'll, we'll leave again. 
But we got robbed here. It wasn't safe and secure. Paul is saying this salvation you have, no one can take it from you. But again, in light of what's happening here, you can give it up if you abandon the truth. Don't do that. So, because of the hope you have laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Again, they heard of this hope of eternal life in the gospel, the good news. But Paul doesn't always modify it by saying the word of truth. He does here. Why? Well, Romans 1.16 and that verse is on your handout, it says the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's how a person comes to be saved, that sin that we can do nothing about to get rid of, the gospel can. That, that life, those habits that we can do nothing about to change and overcome, the gospel can. It's the power of God for salvation but, here's what we need to realize. The gospel is only as powerful as it is truthfully understood and lived out. You know what? The gospel is true, but it's not like I can take a Bible, or in this case, our trusty tablets, and just hold it up to someone and, you know, here's the gospel. You've got to become a Christian now. I tagged you. No, they have to truthfully understand it and then commit to it, live it out. The gospel is powerful, but there has to be that element. Well, that's what Paul is saying here, this word of truth. It has to be the true gospel. It's the true gospel that brought you into the saving relationship with God. It's the true gospel that has been working on you. This false gospel, which isn't good news at all, that people are beginning to tell you, it won't do that. Matter of fact, it can do just the opposite. You can lose that treasure if you give it up because you buy into this false gospel. You've got to be aware of this. Well, again, to just lead up to it, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love with which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, verse 6, which has come to you, just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Now, he's going to talk about a couple things here, but before he does, I want to make sure we're aware of the things he's talking about. You realize there are three aspects of salvation. And sometimes when we think of you know, being saved and salvation, we think of mainly the one, having my sins forgiven. And maybe the other that corresponds to that, spending eternity in heaven. But you realize there's a middle section, that transformation. You know, the biblical words for that, you know, for forgiveness is justification. And later for when I, you know, my new eternal body in heaven is glorification. But the, that period right now of God working in me and changing and transforming me is sanctification. Well, as Paul talks about this here, he talks about the two aspects of the gospel's effects. He says it has been increasing. In other words, as people hear this news, this gospel, more and more people are, are becoming Christians. They're being forgiven, and because of that, they have that hope of heaven, of glorification. But then he also says it's bearing fruit, and that's talking about this stage as Christians now after I become a Christian, before I die, that I change and grow and mature into the, the image of Christ. That's what bearing fruit is, the fruits of the Spirit. He says the gospel is doing that all over the world, even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it. In you or other translations among you. In other words, since you heard of it in Colossae, it's still being spread. More people are becoming Christians, and you who've been Christians for a while, you are growing and maturing as you get deeper into it. It is increasing in number, and it's bearing fruit in the people there. And that is the nature of the gospel. Not every person who hears the gospel is going to accept it, but as the gospel is spread, people will accept it, and people who have committed to it, as we dig into it and we just see more and more about God, we will bear more and more fruit. If we're truly looking at the gospel in, with the true commitment that we made. 
And the key is that he, that he says, you heard it and you understood the grace of God in truth. Again, this grace is the source for our forgiveness in heaven, but it's also the source for my growth. It's not like, well, I'm, I'm saved by grace, I'm forgiven by grace, I'm going to go to heaven by grace, but I've got to work hard now, it's all up to me. It's still by God's grace that I grow. Do I have a part in it? Absolutely, just like I had a part in becoming a Christian. I had to choose it and commit to it. I have to follow through on that commitment, but my growth comes just as much by God's grace as my forgiveness. He says, you have to understand that grace. And again, in all truth, there's people telling you lies. Don't listen to them. Don't buy into it. And we have to understand it. You know, here's the key. We don't have to understand everything about the Bible. You remember there's a verse where Peter says, you know what, that Paul guy, some of the things he writes are hard to understand. That was Peter speaking. And some of the Bible is hard to understand. We don't have to understand at all, but we do have to understand what he keys on here. He talks about understanding the grace of God in truth. The gospel is the word of truth. We have to understand the grace nature of the gospel. That is the key to the truth, and it's the very opposite of the false teaching that he was talking about. And I want us to stop for a second and realize, who is Paul writing to here? He's writing to Christians. There's not a book of the Bible written to non-Christians. In the New Testament. You say Jonah's preaching to Nineveh, being there, but New Testament, it's all to Christians. And so Paul's saying there is a danger that you could succumb to this false teaching. There's a danger that you don't fully understand the truth. I want to make sure you do. Well, if it was possible for them, it's possible for us. So often, I believe it's easy for us to think, well, you know, of course I understand the gospel. I've been at this Christian stuff for a lot of years, let me tell you. Since I was a kid, I've been, you know, I've been in a lot of classes. I, I've sat through so many Sunday school classes. Yeah, I've got pen after pen. And, and, you know, and I think maybe for us in, in the Christian churches, uh, you add in another, like, you know, we get baptism and so many other people miss it. And all those things can make me think, well, of course I understand the gospel. Well, I think we understand it, but do we understand it as well as we could? I, I would ask you that. If I said, do you understand the gospel, the grace nature of the gospel 100%, would you say 100%? Like there's no possibility that maybe there's something I could see a little clearer about it. You know, I, I, had a, I remember reading a book. He says, if you've never been, as talking to preachers, if you've never been misunderstood preaching or teaching grace, you're not teaching biblical grace. You know, and you see this in the Bible. Paul in Romans, he's talking about grace. He has to stop like every chapter. What shall, and he's like these people, you know, I hear this objection every time. What shall we say then, Paul? Shall we do this? Like, no, you're misunderstanding grace. It's true. You know, it also makes me think of a verse in Ephesians that I shared uh, either last week or the week before. Ephesians 3 there on your handout says, I pray that you, and here's this Parallel passage, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. And remember what I said? I, I want you to know something that you'll never fully be able to know. <laughs> so that right there is saying, there's a ch it's not just a chance, you know, because God's love and God's grace go hand in hand. Paul says I'll never fully understand it, so I don't want to say I'm done, you know, I, I've check off grace, I've got that one. Check off God's love, I've got that one. No, God, I want to see it more fully and more clearly my whole life till the day I die. And that's what we're talking about today. And that's really the key to Colossians. Today is just setting this tone, it's asking this question, am I missing some of what God intends for me? And I hope you'll say, maybe I am, I want to find out. I want to see what can I gain through this that I haven't, no matter how many years I've been at this, no matter how many sermons I've heard, I believe going through Colossians, I can see something I haven't seen before. God, I can get a glimpse of you and I can experience even more of what you want for me. Well, Paul's not done, but he is wrapping up. Verse 7, 
He says, just as you learned it from Epaphras, just as you learned this gospel, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. Epaphras apparently learned this true gospel from Paul, and he taught them. And notice, he says they learned it. Not just they heard it, they learned it. And you're going to see this emphasis in Colossians on learning and knowledge. And I tell you, that goes against culture today, you know. And unfortunately, it's often an overreaction. People get so focused on just learning the facts and not doing them. And then people come along and say, well, let's just do stuff. And they're like, but they got no clue what they're doing. And the Bible, the gospel is both. I, I learn it, I understand it, and I live it out. He says, that's what you did. And he talks about your love in the Spirit, again, that key trait. And what's interesting, this is the only mention of the Holy Spirit in the book of Colossians is right here. The rest of his focus is going to be on Christ because that's what was being undermined by the false teachers. All right, so there's those uh, verses 3 through 8, 1 through 2 as well, but 3 through 8, one sentence. Did you think you could do that in one breath? That'd be a lot. But as I said, this is an introduction. Paul is going to go deeper into all of these things later, but the focus today is on what I said. Am I missing some of what God intends for me? Am I missing some of it? You know, do I fully understand, am I, and am I fully living out the true gospel? Again, he says the word of truth, and he has to say that to them because there is false teaching. Well, you know what? 2,000 years later, there's still false teaching. There is still false teaching. But here's what you need to realize about, about false teaching. The very fact that Paul has to warn them about it means it is, though it's false, it looks good enough for some people to believe in. Matter of fact, he's going to call it later plausible arguments, persuasive arguments. He's going to say, I, I, you know, if these people were standing up and saying, hey, listen, Jesus was a cosmic chicken with three heads, Everyone's going to say, nope, don't believe that one. But they aren't saying that. They're saying things that aren't right, but are close enough for someone to say, well, that sounds plausible. I could be persuaded by that. Always remember that about false teaching. The fact that it's out there means someone believes it. Some are more obvious than others. I mean, today we have the false teaching of the health and wealth gospel. Thanks to our friend Joel Olstein and others of his kind who say, God wants you to always be healthy and always be wealthy. Well, that hasn't been my experience. It's not the Bible's experience. But realize there are plenty of people for whom that is plausible. Now, does fallen human nature come into play? I'd like that to be true, yeah. <laughs> but fallen human nature comes into play with all of these. It makes us susceptible to all of them. And you know what, there, there's one, and I mentioned it, I believe, last week, that's similar to this, but it's a little less obvious, and more people are caught up in this one. It's the idea of what I call faith that versus faith in. You're so many people today, I have faith that God is going to, and then fill in the blank, and it's usually something they have decided. You know, so many people today believe the difference between non-Christians and Christians. When I wasn't a Christian, I relied on myself to get what I want my own efforts and skills and resources, but now that I'm a Christian, I rely on God to get what I want. And the first part's good. It's the second part that's the problem, to get what I want. Are we to rely on God? Yes. But it's not God to do everything I want him to do. And that's what this faith that. You hear people, I have faith that God's going to do. Well, how do you have faith that? Did he promise you that? Oh, he wants me to be happy. Did he tell you that? There's just so much that's less obvious. You read the Bible and you won't find faith that. You'll find faith in, over and over and over. Faith in God, who he is, not anything specific, just in him to be in control and love me and whatever happens. And that one's easier to fall prey to. Uh, we're all familiar with the, the false teaching about baptism and not being a part of the plan of salvation, but that one's pretty plausible. The majority of the Christian world believes it. And you know what? You see how it came about. You know, the Reformation and Martin Luther and the Catholic Church was so focused on works, and he said, no, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and he was totally right. It's not by works. The problem is a contemporary of his, Aldrich Zwingli, came along a little later and said, yeah, and baptism's one of those works that salvation's not by. Well, baptism's not a work. In fact, in Colossians, you'll find the only place where baptism and work is in the same sentence. 
It's not us who's doing the work. And speaking of that, that's a key element of all false teaching. Again, then and now is works. Legalism versus grace. And it is so plausible. You know, as a matter of fact, you see all these examples, and obviously someone bought into it. I used to preach in Red Key, Indiana. You always get bonus points if you know where Red Key is. There are right. Someone knows. Down one yeah, between Portland and Muncie. Uh, yeah, preach it. Red Key, it was only known they had a restaurant for a while that was apparently well known. Shambargers had one sitting a night, 12 courses, and had like made reservations a year out. Uh, it's been closed for years, and they have a theater now that books Blues Acts. But other than that, Red Key is not exactly a metropolis. Well, I preached there. One thing, though, this little town of 1500 had like six or seven churches. One of them was a Baptist church. And they had their main worship center, and then they had a fellowship hall, and in between, it was connected with a sidewalk and an awning. Well, think about it. We're here in Indiana, and not every February day is like this. you got to go from the worship center to the fellowship hall. Well, you probably put your coat you know, on the coat. Just think of how cold that could be going back and forth between there. And I used to wonder, you know, why didn't they enclose that? Why didn't they make a hallway you could go through, and maybe they didn't have enough money or something or that? Found out from someone. No, if they had enclosed it, with walls and studs and insulation and drywall, then the fellowship hall would have been part of the church building and you can't eat in church. But as long as there aren't walls, if there's just a sidewalk and awning, then it's okay. Now we laugh at that. It was plausible to those people. See, what they do is always <laughs> foolish. What we do, oh, of course, that makes total sense. We've got to be open to it. You've got to be open. I've got to be open because I've got the things too. I look at them. I look at you. and ho, ho. But mine makes total sense. I've got to be willing to say, God, am I missing it? Am I missing out on something? And you know what? I mean, they're just missing out on keeping warm as they go back and forth. But there's more underlying that. If that's my lifestyle, my mentality, the God of the universe says, thou shalt not have walls between your worship center in your, no, what kind of God is that? I'm missing out on who I think God is. That's not bringing glory to God. I mean, that's making a mockery of him in one sense, but it sounded plausible to them. So is there something that I don't know that I don't know? And I realize that's an impossible question because the answer to that would be, I don't know. <laughs> but here's what I would say, how do I find out? How do I find out? And the answer there is self-examination. I have to be willing to look at myself. And sometimes that self-examination is aided by other mature Christians, friends of mine, and say, hey, <laughs> do you see something in me that all along you're thinking, really? <laughs> I, I want you to tell me. The key here is willingness. But you'll notice on your handout, and I found this to be true, and so I put it on just about every sermon outline, I believe there's a root problem. You know, you can hear all this, and it sounds good, but there's something underneath. It's like a hole in the bucket from that first week, and in this case, it's exactly like that, because the root problem here, I believe, is pride. Again, it's so easy to have it, and pride doesn't mean you walk around saying, hey, I'm so great, look at me. It just is this part of me that says, ah, I've got this. And I, I go back to, I think, if we've been Christians a long time, if we've been in lots of classes, and the fact that we, you know, again, baptism is a key thing. It's how you get into the family, and I think we have it right, and so many people have missed it. But if it helps build up in me a sense of pride, then that's a bad thing, and I can miss other things about the Bible. And so the root problem is pride. Well, what's the key to overcoming it? What's the opposite of pride? What did Jesus say when the disciples asked him who's the greatest? Matthew 18, 3 and 4. He says, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I've got to set aside any pride that says, I don't need to examine and see if there's something I'm missing. I've got to be humble and say, well, of course there's a chance to learn more about God's love. It says it right there. It surpasses knowledge. Who am I to think I've got it all figured out? And God, please show me. And that leads into what do I need to do now? And I would say three things to follow up on what we've seen today. The first one is pray for God to show any area where you're missing the true gospel, the full grace. I'm not saying this means you're not saved. What I'm saying is you're missing out on some of the glory that God has. 
Like, oh, there's so much more to this. I want you to get it. Second, commit to humble openness. God, I, it's not easy, but if you show it to me, I'm going to look for it. I'm going to act on it. Commit to humble openness. And then I would say this. Talk over these sermons with a trusted Christian friend. It makes such a difference when you interact with someone else. You know, one thing that you'll hear me talk about uh, is what I call the growth triangle. Three things that come into play for our growth. The foundation of the triangle is obviously the Word of God. I see the truth there. But then one leg of the triangle are situations. God allows things to happen. God providentially makes things happen at times to put me in situations where I can see these principles lived out, where I can see how it works when I trust Him, where I can see what happens when I don't. <laughs> Have you seen things like that? Tell you what, whenever you see a principle and you say, God, I'm ready to learn this, trust me, he will give you a test. He'll give you one of those situations. And then the other leg of the triangle are trusted Christian friends. People that you can talk with, people you can encourage and they can encourage you. And you put those together, the Holy Spirit's in the middle working through all of them. My prayer is in the middle, praying for God to work through all of them. That's the growth triangle. And so don't miss any element of that. And when we do, what will it look like? Well, you remember what Paul said? This gospel that's being spread everywhere and it's still being spread there in Colossae, it is increasing and bearing fruit. When I fully commit to this openness and say, God, show me what it is, I will bear this fruit of whatever it is, the peace, the joy, the, the lack of worry, the you know, better relationships, whatever it is, as I fully live out this love of God, and it will increase. Just think what our witness will be when people see that in us, see something truly different. That will have such an impact on the people around us. Well, as always, sometimes it's a matter of, I've been a Christian for years, and now I need to put this into practice. Sometimes it may be a matter of, I haven't made that decision yet. For whatever reason, something has been keeping me from it. But we're going to sing a, a hymn of invitation, and it's a chance for all of us. Again, it's an invitation for those who aren't Christians, but it's always an invitation for me, and today especially. <laughs> God, I am going to commit to humbly examining, to going through, uh, is what Paul says in Colossians, and just seeing, is there something, just like those people who are in danger of missing something, is there something I'm in danger of missing or I've missed? This is our invitation to commit to that.